Welcome to Trench Diaries. Iron Coffins, Part 4. During the next two days and nights, I adjusted gradually to my new way of life. I became acquainted with most of the crew, made myself useful wherever possible and took my place on the second watch every eight hours. I learned how to ride with the boat's movement, how to climb up and down the aluminum ladder in the conning tower without injury, how to keep my balance while staggering through the center aisle in heavy seas, how to duck through the circular bulkheads, how to eat my meals between the extremes of the boat's motions, how to use the pump in the washroom by operating its various valves in proper sequence. I also learned that the captain's harshness was only a shell around a very personable character. He was married and had a baby son. Also, to our mutual surprise, we had practically grown up together. We had attended the same high school and studied with the same professors, had drunk from the same water fountain in the courtyard and learned to love the sea while sailing on Lake Constance. These discoveries however did not change Paulson's attitude toward me. On the contrary, I felt that this made my training even more rigorous. While my two classmates, Gerloff and Gubel, escaped his constant observation, he developed a strange habit of catching me in my narrow bunk after an exhausting day and sending me back to work in the engine compartment instead of allowing me to rest. Nonetheless, I managed to stay awake on duty. On the fifth day of our near-fatal trip, we approached Kiel at around 0700. We sailed past the Navy's war memorial, which pointed like an admonishing finger into the morning sky. The Bay of Kiel opened beneath the rising mist, and the boat maneuvered cautiously through the mounting traffic toward the naval base. At 10.30 on April 26, U557 finally came to rest at the pier. Our rusty boat berthed near the stern of the tender lech. The lines were not yet fully secured when Kern, the XO, crossed to the liner to arrange for the crew's lodging and for Eckstein's last journey to his hometown. For the next two hours every hand was kept busy transporting damaged suitcases, soaked sea bags and trunks from the U-boat to the steamer. The ship's comfortable cabins contrasted sharply with our tight quarters aboard U-557. I established myself in a third-class cabin, then returned to my boat, which was being stripped down for repairs and a new fitting out. Seven months of rough training, climaxed by our recent damages, had left deep scars throughout the boat. But the men had already forgotten their brush with death. They were relaxed and cheerful as they worked, while a radio blared out the latest popular tunes. I was in the petty officer's wardroom when Gerloff came rushing down the aisle asking have you heard the bad news? Haven't heard anything, I said. What are you talking about? He replied, Kretschmer and Shupka are presumed sunk. I can't believe it. But the news was confirmed by Lieutenant Seibold. U-99, with Kretschmer in command, and U-100 under Captain Shupka, had indeed been destroyed while attacking a convoy in the North Atlantic. Both legendary captains had been considered indestructible and their loss, which was the first to be admitted publicly in 18 months of U-boat action, reminded us that the war at sea was increasing in intensity as the British built up their defenses. Kretschmer, the tonnage king, had sunk close to 325,000 tons of enemy shipping including three destroyers. This was equal to the entire tonnage of a medium-sized seafaring nation. Shupka, with more than 250,000 tons to his credit, was killed when his boat was rammed by the destroyer that had forced him to the surface. Kretschmer on the other hand, was captured and spent the rest of the war as POW in Canada. The double tragedy, which had occurred on March 17 stunned and baffled the country. Had the British introduced new weapons or techniques of anti-submarine warfare? So far, hunting surface vessels had been relatively easy. U-boats were fast and maneuverable on as well as beneath the surface and were also capable of diving below the maximum usable depth of British depth charges. Our losses were negligible compared with the casualties U-boats had inflicted upon our adversaries. We had no explanation. Supreme Headquarters, to soften the bad news, issued a statement declaring that U-boats had since the outbreak of war sunk well over 4 million tons of enemy shipping, as well as one battleship, one aircraft carrier and 18 smaller vessels of the Royal Navy. It didn't cheer us up much. U-557 was taken to the shipyard for complete overhaul, including the batteries and all engines and motors. For one week the crew shuttled daily between the pier and dry dock. For me, 
new experiences followed in rapid succession. The first day I was sent to the Admiralty to complete our navigational files with charts of the Atlantic. The second day I helped the XO inventory and complete our library of artillery and torpedo manuals. On the third day, Seibold made use of my modest administrative skills and my ability to adequately use a typewriter. The chief engineer made me cross-check lists of all government-issued property that had to be accounted for. Tools, spare parts, seamen's gear, even jars of medicine. The officers displayed a tendency to unload their work on us ensigns, and the nights as well as the days were filled with tedious chores. Finally the weekend brought relief. On Saturday, I drove into Kiel with Google and Gerloff and we browsed through the bookstores looking for reading material for the long weeks at sea. We had Viennese cake in a cafe and steak for dinner in the Rotskeller, our favorite restaurant. We drank copious quantities of Moselle wine, toasting each other in our first joint successful mission. It never occurred to us that our first battle might also be our last. On Monday, May 5, U557 sailed out of the shipyard fully overhauled. She had received a fresh coat of grey paint and looked and smelled newly commissioned. We spent the day in the bay making trim dives and other maneuvers, checking instruments and engines for proper function. I was amazed by the crew's high standards and the ship's great maneuverability. Although she displaced 770 tons and was 75 meters long, she responded to the chief's commands with speed and precision. On May the 8th, we sailed to the arsenal where we loaded the boat with 14 torpedoes. Most of them were of the newest design. They were electrically powered and equipped with magnetic detonators. After the last two torpedoes had been secured in their racks on the floor, wooden deck plates were fastened over the sleek metal fish, leaving just enough room for the men to crawl to their bunks and to the torpedo tubes. The next day we took on food and ammunition. Cans, barrels and cartons were carefully sorted and stowed. While shells for our 8.8cm deck gun and our 2cm anti-aircraft gun were lowered into special compartments, the provisions were distributed throughout the boat. I was astounded to see the food supply for 8 weeks disappear between pipes, valves, machines, closets and ducts. Huge smoked pieces of ham were hung in the control room. Treats, such as whipped cream, butter, coffee and tea were locked up for distribution by the captain. On May 12th, we received loads of fresh vegetables, eggs, bread and fresh water. We squeezed the loaves into the last unoccupied nooks and crannies and filled three hammocks with the rest, letting them swing free in the bow and aft compartments. As the days of preparation ended, our carefree mood turned serious. Retiring to the cabin on the old steamer, I packed my surplus gear into suitcases, registered their contents and labeled the luggage. In case I did not return, my belongings would be sent back home. Then I wrote a final letter to my parents and another to Mary Ann. I was ready to face the unknown. On the morning of May 13, U557 was finally ready to sail. As a last measure, we brought aboard our clothing and a few personal belongings like writing materials, books and pictures of the family and of one or more girls. Shaving implements were prohibited. Our beards would have to grow because the boat's limited supply of fresh water was to be used only for cooking and drinking. At 11.30 the boat's company assembled on the ocean liner for an extraordinary farewell dinner. The staff of the 5th U-boat flotilla turned up to wish us Godspeed. After the exceptional meal, the flotilla's commander toasted the captain and crew and expressed his best wishes for a successful mission. Then he added, since one among you has his birthday today, this makes the 13th of May a good day to sail. Let it be a sign of luck which shall prevail throughout your patrol. Happy birthday to Ensign Werner. I was surprised. I suspected that the leak came from Seibold, who knew my statistics. Our spirits were high as we emptied our last glass of champagne and as we poured out of the steamer onto the pier, a navy band was playing and a large crowd had gathered. After some final preparations, U557 silently slid away in reverse. Fifty meters from the pier, the XO swung the boat around and ordered the diesels started. A strong vibration traveled through the hull and for a moment dark fumes escaped the exhausts. The twin screws beneath the stern thrashed the water into a foamy whirlpool. Both engines ahead standard, steer 9-5. U557 turned sharply to starboard and thrust forward toward the center of the bay. The music faded and the crowd lining the waterfront dispersed. For the next two days, we traversed the Kiel Canal. 
When we reached its western end, we met two other U-boats that had been waiting for our arrival. At precisely 10.00 a pack of three wolves headed for the open sea. The shore soon faded into a very thin line, then it sunk below the horizon. The wolf pack sailed in line, with U-557 in the lead. I was on watch. Before long, the island of Helgoland appeared on port side. A rain squall came down like a curtain however, and blotted out the view. To the east beyond the horizon was Denmark and the continent. To the west, only a few miles away, huge minefields loomed just below the surface. Dusk came slowly, gradually turning the sea into a dark mass. I had plenty of time to make my peace with God. At midnight Gerloff relieved me from watch. I fell through the hatch and lowered myself into the black hull. The conning tower was illuminated only by a feeble shimmer from the fluorescent face of the compass. The control room was dimmed and I could barely make out the hull, the dials, wheels, switches, valves, and equipment. A small lamp, well shaded, distributed a soft light over the chart table. With the boat listing and swaying beneath me, I staggered into the petty officer's small wardroom where I had my berthing. I folded myself into the tight berth, closed the aluminum guard rail and wedged myself between it and the wall. For long hours I was kept awake by the diesel's rhythmical knocks and the splashing of water against steel and by my thoughts of sailing against the enemy.